Welcome to Healthy Frontiers. My name is Dr. Bizzoni, and this show is dedicated to the education of our viewers. Tonight's topic is orthodontics today. My special guest is Dr. Rich Bridgham. Dr. Br Rich Bridgham is a orthodontist. He's been practicing for over 11 years in Somers, New York, although he grew up here on White Plains. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics. He's a fellow of the American Association of Orthodontists. And Dr. Bridgham is also the vice president of the Somers uh, Lions Club. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Bridgen to the show tonight. Thank you. Welcome, Rich. Thank you. How you doing? Good. Okay. Rich, talk to me a little bit about your background and why you became an orthodontist. And okay. Uh, well, as you mentioned, I grew up here in White Plains right. and decided to stay a little closer to home and uh, go to college out at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Right. And uh, while I was at uh, school, I wasn't sure whether it was health sciences that I wanted to concentrate in or something along the line of engineering. And so I became very involved at the college, uh, became an emergency medical technician, uh, worked at the university hospital, uh, so I was getting a lot of hands-on in emergency medicine and getting a pretty good feel of uh, what it is uh, to be or have life of a physician. And uh, after a while, I decided that maybe I'd like to uh, see what it's like to be a dentist, and they had a dental school there. Uh, so I assisted and volunteered for a while there and just fell in love with dentistry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, that had me, um, you know, I was concerned, of course, as most people I think would be, that, you know, how would it be to spend the rest of your life putting hands in your people's mouth? Yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at the same time, uh, the thought of helping other people the way that my orthodontist helped me and creating a nice smile and mm -hmm. um, having the benefits of a, a good, stable, uh, healthy dentition was very attractive. Sure. And uh, so I looked into dental school and decided it was time to leave New York and see a little bit of the United States. So I went out to Chicago and uh, had four years of dental training at Loyola University in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And from there, when I decided that for sure I would like to be an orthodontist, uh, I needed to spend a year in a general practice residency, which most, because of the fact that there's 200 orthodontists that graduate each year within the United States, mm -hmm. and there's typically anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people that are vying for those 200 spots, so it's fairly competitive. Um, so there's a demand to have a training of one year at a general practice residency just to strengthen your skills as a general dentist right. uh, before you then move on to the specialty of orthodontics. So I came back and spent a year at the Long Island Jewish Hospital out in uh, New Hyde Park and mm -hmm. from there I went down to the Albert Einstein Medical Center for three years of orthodontic training. Right. So as a total it was about 12 years altogether, four years of college, four years of dental school, and then the four years of uh, the general practice residency in orthodontic training. So to go past, to become an orthodontist, you have to do an extra four years after you're a regular dentist? Correct. Okay. All right. And uh, how many people in the United States wear braces? What's the uh, statistic? There are about four million uh, adolescents or children adolescents in braces at any given time, and there's about a million adults that uh, are now involved in orthodontic treatment. So of the 300 million population of the United States, there's, you know, at any given time, there's about 5 million people in braces. That's quite a lot. Yep. That's quite a lot. And it's increased, I'm sure, since you, you started your practice Continues 10, 11 years to ago, grow, right? yep. I know what I see is a lot of patients coming to me. I see a lot of adults now. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we talk about adults with braces, okay. why don't we talk about children? When's the first time a parent might consider bringing their child to an orthodontist? And in fact, do they have to be referred by their general dentist, or can they walk in the door? Well, uh, the American Association of Orthodontists recommends that at the age of seven, all children are screened. Um, and I'd say that's, that trend is starting to meet that uh, criteria as far as it, it's a great time to see an orthodontist specifically for having photographed pictures taken just to establish what the dentition, how the jaws are developing. Uh, and then from there, over the next two years, there's a tremendous amount of changes that most times will get better naturally, mm -hmm. and it's great. Uh, for a parent to have the uh, knowledge that you know things are getting better on their own, uh, but there's that let's say 20, 25 percent of kids end up having problems that will tend to get worse over time, and that's where some early intervention could be you know good to have, typically around the age of eight to ten. So okay. seven's a great time to bring the children in. Um, as far as orthodontics in general, like how old can you be to have orthodontic treatment? Um, I just recently finished a, a patient at the age of 82 uh, that went through orthodontic treatment. Wow. So our feeling is you're never too old as long as your teeth and, and gum tissues and bone are healthy. Great, right. Uh, and, you know, there's so many advances in orthodontia 
uh, these days. Um, why don't you talk to me? Uh, just let's go in general a little bit about some of the advances and trends in orthodontics okay. today. I know your practice. I always hear great things, and you're on the cutting edge of everything. So, go well, ahead. there's there's definitely uh, been a tremendous amount of changes just in the last 20 years of time, and the advances I say are, are rolling along. Uh, so quickly just within the last few years that it's almost tough to kind of keep up with everything as it moves along. But the braces, the wires, the retainers, the treatment itself has uh, changed tremendously in the last 20 years. Uh, of course, computers now just play a tremendous role um, as far as the practice management side of helping patients get through a treatment. Uh, there's clear retainers. Uh, most people are familiar with Invisalign as a treatment option, particularly for adults. Uh, there's temporary implants and computer imaging as far as the x-rays are concerned are the two hot topics right now mm -hmm. um, that I'll you know, go into a little bit about. Yep. The trends themselves, I'd say uh, today, the teens feel like braces are cool, which is great for me. The yeah, parents sure. aren't dragging the uh, adolescents into the office. Sure. Kicking and screaming. That's right. <laughs> um, adults are seeing you know, the great results of their kids and seeing how much less time it takes all together, so they're opting for braces or orthodontic treatment. Uh, we see that the, um, another big change just within New York State alone, and this is, of course, across the country, uh, but New York State uh, now has programs available for having assistance of orthodontists licensed, uh, which is you know, creating a more knowledgeable team, which creates more efficiency in the office, and again, back to the, the less time it takes altogether. Sure. And how are the braces different today? Uh, well, I brought some examples with me of a okay. uh, couple of different types of braces. Actually, I'll have you just hold this up. Sure. Um, this is basically to show that there are clear braces today on the right-hand side here. I'm sorry, on the left-hand side. I'm used right. to seeing the patient on the right. Yeah, <laughs> <It's patient's> right. <laughs> on the left-hand side uh, that most adults opt for. Uh, and the nice thing about that, clear braces have been around for probably at least uh, close to 20 years, but today there's porcelain brackets uh, that are very simple to put on and take off, which is a big issue for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, braces that are clear typically required a, a larger or higher mechanical retention, and the problem would be that when you take them off, it could take some enamel with it. Mm -hmm. Not a problem today, uh, whether the braces are metal or clear. They're very simple to take off, and, and they just you know, release themselves. Actually, they have a self-defense mechanism where if the pressure is too great, even during the treatment, the bracket will just simply pop off. So the retention is good enough to stay on throughout the duration of treatment, but once it increases to a certain point, then it'll end up popping off. So, uh, And obviously leave all the enamel intact. So I'd say altogether the braces are sleeker and more comfortable than what they ever were before. Mm -hmm. uh, even the metal brackets are much smaller altogether. Right. Um, they used to have bands that wrapped around every sure. you know, individual tooth. I had tooth. those 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> those were known as the train tracks. Uh, that was yeah. the more traditional treatment back then. Um, and you know, so just the bonding of the brackets alone are, are much better. Uh, of course, we've had now for a little bit of time here, children can choose uh, from a variety of different colors. So we typically have something like this color palette out on our tables, and each time that the kids come in, uh, they'll go ahead and choose the different colors. And just according to the time of the year, holidays, sports teams, uh, right now the blue and white are hot for the Yankees, and the blue and orange for the Mets uh, okay. are just a you know, typical color. Right. Or even just for school colors, they, they choose the different colors. They certainly don't think ahead like this is going to be there for a year or more. So <laughs> right. it's going to change it to another color. Exactly. So we tell them up front that every time they come in, we want to be able to check how well they're brushing their teeth so they'll have the option of choosing the different colors. Right. And then this is just specifically showing the, the clear braces, again, which most uh, adults opt for. Uh, mm -hmm. Once they're in your mouth and the saliva contacts the porcelain, it really blends in very nicely. So it really tends to uh, make the braces obviously much less noticeable. It looks a little bit more like you're just wearing a retainer altogether. I see. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'd say another you know, big advance in just the braces themselves, even before we consider braces, are here's uh, an example of common problems that we see at the age of nine. Uh, this is just showing a model of uh, if teeth, adult teeth were to come down in an ideal fashion, if the gums and the bone were clear, this is what the adult teeth look like underneath the baby teeth that are on their way down. Mm -hmm. So this is again is showing at the age of nine, typically there's 12 adult teeth and 12 baby teeth uh, with the other adult teeth coming in in a nice fashion. 
more commonly, uh, fortunately for orthodontists, I'd have to say, <laughs> is we see issues uh, along this line where the canine teeth are moving in different directions, there's not enough room, there's a cramping of the jaw size itself, and so we see not only crowding, or this is what you would typically see in the mouth, but what you can't see underneath is that the teeth are heading in all different directions. And this would be a reason to consider uh, a treatment, braces, or uh, some type of uh, expansion to the jaw at an earlier age of 9, 10. Um, both, I would say to help this out, what we can do is just showing this photograph pictures here. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Is here's a, a common patient. I'll have you hold this up. Mm -hmm. I came in at the age of 10, and they're down to the last primary molars here. And you can see that the adult tooth that comes in on the other side uh, is much smaller than the, the primary tooth itself. So this is a great time to consider this very simple bar that's placed uh, that alone will start the process of uncrowding the teeth altogether. The space that's gained in having the primary tooth lost, uh, the teeth that are crowded up front will actually start to shift backward, what we call distally, and start to the process of lining the teeth. So mm -hmm. here's an example of a, a very common situation of lower crowding. Right. We would like to try and avoid taking adult teeth out in the future, which again was very common in the past. Sure. Uh, at the same time, if we don't take adult teeth out, we want to try and avoid just taking the teeth and pushing them forward right. because at a later time they'll have a tendency just to crowd back up again. So here we place this simple bar in. She had uh, the teeth uncrowded, so this is just showing from the front side uh, the difference that the, the bar alone can make. And then by placing braces now for a much shorter time at the, at the age of 12 to about 13 and a half, uh, this just finishes the process of perfectly aligning the teeth and creating a nice bite. And how long did this take to happen? From the, start to finish? Let's say the, the bar was in for approximately nine months of time and the braces were placed for about 16 months. Okay. So I would say before a few years ago, without that simple retainer that was placed, the treatment would be approximately 24 months of time with braces alone. Right. Uh, and there would be a lot of compromises to it that you can still make the teeth look good, mm -hmm. but another five to ten years later there's going to be crowding and a lot of instability is right. going to make things relapse over time. You need to make sure you clear up all those inner problems so that the what we're looking at is really true and it's going to last for a long time. Exactly. Okay. Is this hereditary, Rich? Uh, I'd say most of what you see in the oral structures are highly hereditary. Okay. So most of the issues that I start to discuss with parents, they start shaking or nodding their heads saying, oh, that was the, you know, the issue for me, whether it was oh. canine impaction or the type of crowding or spacing that we see. Right. Almost always the parents are uh, nodding their head that that was the same issue for them. Mm -hmm. um, before I get into retainers, yep. there's a significant uh, change in the wires themselves. In the past, we used to only have stainless steel wires of which when you went into the orthodontist, and you might remember, uh, you, you were to dread the terrible cranking and twisting of wires, uh, knowing that it was going to be a fairly painful experience. And that was just simply because there was an all-or-nothing process of the pressure that's placed on teeth. So typically if there's a tooth that's like, say, sitting up a little bit higher and we want to bring it down, we'd have to make appropriate bends in the wire itself in order to have the the wire reach up to grab the tooth. But again, it was a, a very stiff pressure that was placed, right. and in the first few days, you knew when the wire was changed. And we don't see the cold one. That's right. <laughs> Today, okay, that's all right. Okay. Today, we can, um, we have wires that once you place into some cooler water, you can deform the wire in a position that will, again, extend up to reach the tooth and this is utilizing some space age technology. This is a copper nickel titanium, uh, which allows pressure over time rather than just instantaneously as you place it. So here's a cooler wire that outside of the mouth is less than 98 degrees. Um, as it's deformed to place into the wire and place into the brackets of the teeth, again, it's it's loses its memory, um, and right now it's just kind of uh, flaccid through the bracket. As it heats up to 98 degrees, then it will start to straighten out, and I'll demonstrate that here. Just I put it in my mouth. Okay, so wow. my tongue didn't do That's that. That's amazing. <laughs> um, basically... Magic tricks. Right. This is, uh, this is space age technology. Uh, it mm -hmm. has to do with uh, NASA creating uh, a metal that when the uh, spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, uh, because the astronaut was in the position to run around the shuttle to turn on all the switches that needed right. to be turned on, they created this copper nickel titanium metal in which the toggle switch would remain inactive until 
the spacecraft heated up on its re-entry, wow. and then all the switches would be uh, flipped. That's amazing. So here, you know, it allows the orthodontist a much greater flexibility in the treatment itself, right. just due to the fact that if I have a patient that is at college and yeah. can't come home for three months, right. here's a wire that we can place that will work over an entire three months of time rather right. than just a few weeks of time. Sure. And if the patient's in discomfort uh, at any given time, which will, you know, can occur once the wire starts to become active, there's certain pressures that can lead to headaches or subtle things uh, mm -hmm. for a temporary period of time, all the patient has to do is take a sip of cold water and the wire then just disengages and relaxes again. So yeah. the patient is even in the control of the working of the wire itself. That's beautiful. And just basically, you know, the, the memory of the wire now is what's dictating the treatment. So the orthodontist uh, is in control of where the brackets are placed, visualizing what mm -hmm. the end result is going to be, right. and then in having this wire with memory uh, flow through it, it's then guiding the teeth into the proper position. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it helped out tremendously in keeping treatment time itself much shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to see patients as often uh, as right. we used to, and, and that's been a very large factor as far as now people enjoying orthodontic treatment than dreading it altogether. Right. So how, how long a period on average would you say for a teenager coming in for braces or versus an adult? I'd say from 15 to 20 years ago, you could expect at least two years of time. Uh, okay. Just within the last five years, I've seen our treatment times go from 20, 22 months down to about 16 to 18 months altogether. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say of several hundred patients that we have at any given time uh, in braces in our office, I may have literally a handful that's gone over the two-year mark. And it usually has to do with a very unusual circumstance yeah. or adult treatment. Uh, the bone is a little bit more dense. Mm -hmm. The teeth are much more comfortable where they used to be uh, yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, and that can end up taking a longer than two-year period of time. Rich, before we go on there, I want to just so I want to, sure. I want to miss on this point. I know the diagnostics are so important. Yes. So let's talk about some of the new uh, X-ray equipment that's out and about now that you're using and utilizing. Sure. And why it's so important to have that diagnosis so correct. Well, I'll tell you the um, the imaging that we're now taking uh, that most orthodontists have the capability of taking in their office. Uh, that's more of a standard of today. Right. Um, that became available maybe five years ago is all of a sudden being overshadowed by three-dimensional uh, imaging. So I have here examples of the standard two-dimensional. Uh, the nice thing about imaging today is that most of it's done through computers. So instead of the traditional x-ray where you're looking through an x-ray film, uh, we can now print it out on a piece of paper for anybody to see what the position of their teeth are and at least from a one side of the jaw view over to the other side how the teeth are positioned. This combined with a view of what we call cephalometric x-ray gives us a good idea through measurements what the position of the teeth are that are being supported by the jaw structures. So for instance, the lower incisors ideally would be about 90 degrees to the lower jaw. Here we're seeing that this patient's teeth are about a 92 degrees. So we know that that's a fairly stable position. Right. It would be best not to flare the teeth forward or pull them back too far if they're already in a fairly stable mm -hmm. position. So these are the things that we're looking for, and at least in a two-dimensional view, the the problem with two dimension has always been, of course, that if you have an issue like what we're seeing here, um, it, this appears to be a six-year molar and then a 12-year molar, and I would have typically told the parent that it looks like the person is missing their 18 or a wisdom tooth, 18-year uh, molar, um, when in reality they're just superimposed with each other, like what you may see here, a little bit more of the teeth are at slightly different angles, so there is a 12-year molar and an 18-year-old molar. Right. Now with three-dimensional computer imaging, mm -hmm. we're able to, in 40 seconds, take a head scan of a patient and now view on the computer their head head as a three dimension. I can bring their skull up, I can match that with three dimensional photography and show you what your face looks like in relation to your skull itself. And then I can slice and dice as you would an MRI or a CT scan just to view uh, issues along this line of mm -hmm. how exactly are the teeth aligned with each other, uh, knowing that the two dimension is just something that is difficult to view uh, from a perspective of a final result of the treatment itself. Mm -hmm. you know, it, a treatment can look like it's, uh, the, the roots are in a decent position given the panoramic x-ray, but may not be from another dimension. Right. So now this is a tremendous change that's just within the last year is now becoming available. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll have this in our office sometime in like September, October, right. um, and, and I know it's going to make a dramatic difference as far as the diagnosis, right. the treatment, and certainly the end results uh, altogether. Sure. And that, 
I know they've been using panoramic x-rays, but this is going to the next level, right? This is definitely going to the next level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we're being promised uh, by the computer imaging companies that uh, with this technology, we should be able to even detect something like a cavity before a dentist would be able to typically view it right. on a two-dimensional film. Right. Um, if someone has a root fracture, it's extremely difficult to view that on again on a two-dimensional because the fracture could be on the side and you're viewing it from the sure. front. You can miss it. Uh, but now you can view the tooth from all different angles. So mm -hmm. uh, again, the diagnosis of just any dental health problem would be much greater with the three-dimensional. Yeah. But you also mentioned about implants. Okay, so how do they work with braces? Well, I have an Talk example. About that. I have an example here of what's uh, known as a traditional implant uh, for patients. People that are missing teeth, uh, I'd say this is a, a fairly large change in the dental field in the last 20 years. For people that are missing teeth, instead of the traditional bridge that used to be placed, um, and that would be by cutting down an adjacent tooth, a healthy adjacent tooth typically, uh, on either side and then replacing a fake tooth in the middle, an implant is basically taking the position of the root itself. So now without touching either of the adjacent teeth, you can have uh, essentially it's a, what's called a biocompatible screw. Um, it's a metal, it's a titanium metal that can be placed within the bone. The bone will then secure itself to the screw uh, and Im become immovable. Uh, and then to that you can now place the crown of the tooth. So by appearance what everybody sees is if you have your natural tooth sitting there. And there's really nothing more natural or, or healthy than uh, a, a replacement of the root itself to replace a tooth. Where orthodontists, I'm sorry, are getting involved is we're starting to place what's called temporary implants. And these are for patients, uh, I'll give a for instance, mm -hmm. for let's say if someone was missing a number of their back teeth and we wanted to uh, take teeth that are crowded and get them into a better alignment for then the general dentist to go ahead and place the implants in. It's difficult to place implants unless you spatially know what's going to be the front tooth natural and a, and a posterior back tooth altogether. So if we didn't want to move this tooth forward, uh, in orthodontics we always have to uh, take into consideration for every action there's a reaction. So if you want to move this front tooth back, you have to pivot with something in the back here or anchor or something, and we don't want this tooth to move forward. So now a tiny screw can be placed without drilling into the bone, uh, can just simply be screwed into the side of the soft tissue comfortably, obviously with some anesthesia, right. and now that can be used for a temporary period of time, whether it's a year or two year, to act as your anchor to then slide the teeth back. You can then, while this stays in the position, because as I mentioned, the bone wraps around it in a way that doesn't allow now that screw to move at all. Right. And now the front teeth can start to be slide back to uncrowd, and then when you're done, you just simply unscrew it and it comes right back out again. So this is called a temporary anchorage device. Uh, that's really a hot topic right now, and, and it really helps out in adult treatment in particular, uh, particularly for those that don't have a full complement of teeth mm -hmm. and or have issues that are very difficult to deal with just standard braces alone. So that's really a, a hot topic there. And you guys need to work with uh, oral surgeons and periodontists and Oftentimes you work in harmony to get the best result here. For Another sure. large change as far as the uh, advances in orthodontics, it's much yeah. more interdisciplinary now than it ever used to be. You know, orthodontists right. used to be kind of their island on their own, create right. a nice smile, line the teeth up, and then you're done with the treatment. Yeah. Um, now we're much more, we, we consider ourselves orthodontists and dentofacial orthopedists. We're concerned with how the jaws are aligned with each other, how right. the teeth are um, aligned within the jaw structures themselves, and then the overall health of the dentition. So right. there's a lot of interplay between periodontists, oral surgeon, and obviously the right. primary care of the general dentist themselves. Sure. Okay. And uh, also, can you help with TMJ problem? Do orthodontists help that? I mean, it's a very common topic. Uh, a lot of people have that. Yes. TMJ meaning the temporomandibular joint. I want to yes. say uh, since I started to help patients out with temporomandibular problems yep. uh, or disorders about 10 years ago, yep. uh, I now more uh, effectively understand how large of a population out there right. suffer from TMJ problems. Sure. Um, I'd say the number one, uh, before I get into the, the issues of TMJ, not all orthodontists treat TMJ problems. Unfortunately, okay. There really are no training programs for TMJ issues. Okay. Um, basically, it's a still a very unknown joint 
within the body uh, that up until now has been very difficult to view by two-dimensional films, right. um, as well as it's a, it's a very difficult area to access, um, mm -hmm. even from, you know, without x-rays to gain access to. So most people tend to ignore it. Mm -hmm. ENTs like to send to the dentist. The dentists right. like to send to ENTs, ear, nose, right. and throat doctors. Yep. Um, but I'd say I found over time that a large population of per people that suffer to any degree from temporal mandibular joint uh, disorders largely has to do with stress. Stress mm -hmm. creates a, a hyperactivity of the musculature, um, the hyperactivity, uh, hyperactivity of the muscles, uh, mm -hmm. just to show in the skull here. Yep. Uh, there's a number of muscles throughout the whole side of the head that interplay with your what's called masticatory system, and that is how you bite and chew with each other. Right. At nighttime, when you're relieving some of your stress, these muscles can engage or what we call hype, become hyperactive, much more so than what you can even do during the day. Um, and so people that clench or grind their teeth are just creating tremendous tension up in this area, which of course is forcing the jaw joint back up into, I'm sorry, forcing the, the lower jaw into the jaw joint, which then creates pressures to create the headaches and discomforts. So right. we're finding that if we place a very simple bite plate, which I believe I have an example here of, um, in the this probably doesn't fit this skull, but we'll try it in there as best we can here. So we place a very simple retainer that when the patient bites down, disengages the back teeth. They're only hitting on the front teeth. Right. Their, ma their bite is slightly open now during the night. It's very difficult for the muscles to become active. Mm -hmm. um, all you have to do is just lightly bite on your finger and, and feel that there's a lot less tension. Right. So if there's now we're eliminating those large tensions during the night, the subtle pressures during the day don't create those headaches and, and annoying uh, discomforts. Right. Now that has to do with maybe about 50% of the patients that I see. Uh, I'd say I've had pretty close to 100% success and those that come in, patients that come in with headaches or uh, some type of discomfort, they leave my office two months later feeling really pretty good and this yeah. is their new best friend. There you go. Um, and I'd say right. that's about 50% of the time uh, with just this bite plate alone. The other 50%, right. we just find that the bite plate starts to help the process, right. but the muscles have trouble fully disengaging, and that's where we, we found that uh, the help of a chiropractor is great for the manipulation of yep. the kind of finishing off of that hyperactivity. We've worked on some patients together. And a number of patients some, together. Uh, and some good results there. Yep. Yep. Rich, great. I think that's terrific. Uh, you know, if people want to get some information about uh, an orthodontist, uh, I know you brought a little something here yep. where people can go on a website. Yeah, and, I'd uh, say the traditional way, of course, if you have a primary uh, care dentist, uh, you know, that's the first person to talk about and right. to see if the timing may be right. Uh, but for anybody that just wants to find out a little bit more about orthodontics in general or would like to find out what orthodontists are in their area, uh, they can go to www.braces.org. Uh, this will put them in contact with the American Association of Orthodontists, and there's just a whole host of information at that website alone. Or they can call this 1-800 number, and that will, again, put them in touch with the American Association of Orthodontists. That's great, Rich. And I want to thank Rich... Bridgem, oh, you're very welcome uh, for being it's here tonight. Thank you. And if you have any questions for Dr. Bridgem, uh, please email my website, and we will shoot them off to him, and he'll be happy to answer any questions that any, anyone might have. I look forward to seeing you on the next show. Thanks for being so attentive.